Okay, shall we start? Yeah, are we starting with the equine community presentation? Okay. Yes, I'm not sure what's your plan, so you just let me know when I should present and I'll share my screen. Namaste. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you all on this Career Campfire session of season one, episode two, organized by Standing Committee on Veterinary Education, International Veterinary Students Association, IBSA Paklihawa. Introducing myself, I am Prakash Rawal, Secretary of International Veterinary Students Association, IBSA Paklihawa. Today's topic for the session is Career Campfire, Colic, How to Approach a Case. And this program is coordinated by Standing Committee on Veterinary Education, IBC, Paklihawa Coordinator, Mr. Alok Dakal. Today, we have two speaker guests, Ms. Zuzanna Zebinska, License Officer, IBC Equine Community, and Ms. Catherine Ross, Event Manager, IBC Equine Community. On the beginning of the session, I would like to call Mr. Alok Dakal, uh, Standing Committee on Veterinary Education Coordinator, IBC Pakliwa, for her, for her his welcome speech. Thank you, Prakas. Warm greetings, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all in this Career Campfires Veterinary Experience Sharing Program organized by IBS Pakliwa, a local chapter under IBS Nepal. In the first episode, we had Dr. Umesh Kumar Mandal sharing about the caesarean section in cattle. And in this second episode of the Career Campfire, season one, today we have a topic, colleague, how to approach a case. Before we get started, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Catherine Rose, event manager at IBSA Equine Community and Ju Javinska, Legion Officer, IBSA Equine Community, who are our precious speaker. We are honored to have you both. We are indeed feeling great for your participation. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. I hope today it will be a day full of learning and all your queries will be fulfilled. At the end, myself, Alok Takkal, SCOP coordinator of IVSA Paklihawa, would again like to welcome you all in this program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alok Takkal. Now I'd like to call Ms. Zanna Zibinska, an officer of IBC Equine Community, for her speech to introduce uh, Ms. Zanna. Hi, thank you so much for your introduction, Prakash and Alok. Um, let me share my screen so we can jump into the presentation. Um, I hope, I'm not sure if you're going to see it now if I... Do you see it shared or do you see it in, in PowerPoint? Is it, are the slides changing? Yep, yes, perfect. Okay, perfect, okay. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Zoe from IVSA Equine Community. Um, before Kathy will talk about the clinical approach to colleagues, I, will like to, I would like to introduce IVSA Equine Community to you. So um, let's start with our aim. We want to help veterinary students worldwide to improve their knowledge and skills in all aspects of equine medicine and surgery by providing free access to genuine learning resources and exposure to various training opportunities globally. But I would like to stress that I really like also um, to see how veterinary students get to know each other in the community, how they make friends worldwide with other equine students. We all know that we need motivation to study, especially now with COVID and everyone's stuck at home and, and we're not sure what resources to use, who to study with. We're looking all for studying buddies and yeah, we are all students, we are all people, we all struggle with similar issues. We, we also need help, so I'm really happy that we can build the community and, and feel like an, a small equine family in our community. I would like to introduce you to our team. I'm not on the slide because I'm, 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 I'm introduced already by myself and by, by our colleagues. Thank you for that. And you can see me, but look at our team. We have two event managers, Catherine and Alexander. 
CG Tanzania Research Manager and Maria and Tyler, our graphic managers. I didn't include pictures because I know it's hard to focus on both pictures and names at the same time. So now look at the pictures because I'm sure you'll, you'll have a pleasure to meet the girls during our events or during our meetings and hopefully an event in person when, when everything will calm down a little bit and we'll be able to meet together. You'll be able to read more about our team also on the website, which is coming soon, hopefully, um, with ivsa.org when you look for SCOVI. Standing Committee on, Equine Edu on <laughs> Veterinary Education, you'll be able to find equine community there as well. So how to join us? Most important, you need to be an IVSA member. So join your local IVSA chapter, contact the president or any other IVSA member. They will definitely help you to join the chapter. It should be easy. And if you have any problems with that, you can also contact us and we'll, we'll get in touch with your IVSA chapter. Then you can go to the address displayed on the screen where you can find a form, membership form, registration form. Fill the form and attach the membership confirmation. This is a really important part because without it, we cannot proceed with your application. So make sure that the membership confirmation is signed by both president and exchange officer of your chapter. Then wait for a welcome email from us, from IVSA Equine Community. Don't get scared if you don't get email within a few days because we now we screen all the applications in the beginning of each month. So in the beginning of February, if you apply now, and yeah, on the first day of the month, you should receive an email. If you don't, then of course, let us know about it. And in the email, you will, you will get all the instructions and more details about how to join the community. Then you can ask to be added to our Facebook group and welcome to our community. Let's talk briefly about our project so you will know what actually we're doing in the equine community. We've organized, we are organizing now meetings to help students motivate each other and study together and find studying buddies. We know that of course we have, even we have access to books and, and scientific papers. It's sometimes hard to just sit alone and motivate each other, motivate yourself to, to go through them and to read them and to actively learn. So we started already last year to organize journal clubs meetings where um, we discuss recent articles on equine medicine and surgery. So we all decide on a particular topic and a particular scientific paper. All the participants read it prior to the meeting. There's one or two people who make a presentation on the paper and then we all discuss it. We share um, our opinions in the paper. We share our experience from the clinic or from the field. We learned with other veterinarians when working with horses. Also in January this year, we are starting, starting with a new meeting, book club meeting. The first meeting will take, take place on the 31st of January. It will be a regular meeting to discuss chapters of a chosen book on equine medicine and surgery. During these meetings, all the participants will have a chance to present a, a small part of the chapter that they read before the meeting. And we will also share our experience and also share our opinions on it and try to contribute together to, to discuss one particular disease, for example. And a new meeting, which will start in February, the first one on the 14th of February, will be a case discussion. So a regular meeting to discuss clinical cases encountered during a traineeship or a read in case report and studies. So this one will also um, let student let students um, work on their presentation skills, but also get more confident where approaching clinical case and try to you know, figure out the, the diagnostic tools, the diagnostic, the differential diagnostics, the treatments, etc. So together we will discuss it as students of, of final years, but also with, with younger students who need more guidance. We are also building a database um, by Anastasia and Petra, and but also our members. In the database, you can find webinars, scientific papers, educational websites, audiovisual resources, and also many more of educational materials on horses. So the database, database includes all the resources sent to us by, by our members and screened by Anastasia to check on, you know, on, the, on the legacy if, if, if it's an illegally a legal book or scientific paper legally downloaded. And this all is shared to IVSA Equine community members so you can have access to it when you join our community. 
that helps students who don't have access to libraries, especially now when we are all at home because of COVID and, and we're not sure where to look for resources online, you can use our database and, and study together with us. All the webinars are also shared on Facebook and are also added to the calendar, Google Calendar of IVSA Equine Community, which you can add on your phone and be up to date with all the webinars. We're also working on an externship database, so you can help us create an extensive database to help other students find a perfect placement for their traineeship. In the database, you can find requirements of um, what, what's required sorry, in, to, to join the clinic, to go for an externship or go for a traineeship or an internship. You can check if there is accommodation provided um, in the clinic or near the clinic, or if it needs to be paid or if it's for free. What's the language spoken in the clinic? What are the opportunities? What are the, um, what are the diagnostic tools used in the clinic? But also, last but not least, atmosphere. So if your time is, time is respected, if you're respected as a student, if you're able to sleep, if you're able to have a break, lunch, etc., all really important information. And I think it's a really valuable, valuable resource. So Kathy, who you will meet in a minute, is also an event manager of IVSA Equine Community and together with Alexandra, they are working on organizing events of IVSA Equine Community. We already organized one online event in December. It was a three day conference and touched many topics from dentistry, from internal medicine and from surgery. It was very, very successful and all the members received materials from the speakers and also received recordings for, the, for their usage only. Uh, after the after the conference, I'm really excited and I'm really proud of this event and I cannot wait for more. And uh, as all of you probably as well, the same as we cannot wait for the events in person to come back to reality. And we we are working on organizing a big event. We already chosen the host, but now we just we're just waiting for the measurement for the measures because of COVID to to loosen up a little bit. And we cannot wait to send you more details about it. And our new project, which has just started, and we, we just closed the registration, but for all the people who are listening to me now, if you are IVSA Equine members, you can still apply today if you would like to join, join our online culture exchange to make new equine friends from all around the globe. We will all share our cultural legends or stories about horses that are are spoken in your region, um, share our experiences. We definitely um, prepare some games for you and, and topics to talk about and just get to know each other before we will have actually a chance to meet in person during real exchanges or events, hopefully the conference. So let me know if you would like to join and you haven't, but you need to be an IVSA Equine member. So if you are not, then Yes, you can, you can register using the form. I'll show you the link again. And if you are a member, and you can also join the culture, the culture exchange. So where to find us? If you're not a member yet, then you can find us on Instagram. You can see the name on the slide and the logo on the slide as well. This is how you can find us. On our Instagram, you can find regular posts that we prepare every month. For example, breed of the month where we choose a particular breed Every month different, we describe the breed briefly and also the most common medical problems that the breed suffers from. You can also find all the announcements and all the most important information and all the important links on our, on our Instagram. And I think the really exciting part of our Instagram is the every week quizzes, which happen on Sunday. And we, all the old quizzes are, are saved in the highlighted stories, as you can see here on the screenshot. So for example, on airways or cardiology and the chronology or dentistry. Today, we're going to have a quiz, which was actually prepared by me about a written epigram by Sue Dyson. So if you're excited about it, you can give it a try today and, and check what you know about it. If you are not a member, then of course you can follow us, yes, on Instagram, but you can also fill the form that I've already mentioned. Here you have the link. I think it might, it's easy to remember, but you can write it down. If needed, or I can send it also later. Then you can join our Facebook group where you can follow 
or the important information, all the webinars or the announcements or the internship opportunities, externship opportunities, scientific papers, everything that we post there. Soon you'll be able also to read about us on our website. I hope it will be updated really soon. I've just sent all the descriptions and all the information. And then follow the group. You can contact us if you have any idea about the project or any idea for the event. Join the projects like the journal meetings or club or book clubs meetings or case discussions or our events which we organize. Or you can also send us a quiz that you can prepare based on a webinar or based on a journal paper, which the paper will be posted also on Facebook. And then we can mention you on Instagram if you tell us your, your Nick, your Instagram Nick. And we can be constantly in touch. If you have any ideas for equine projects, if you're passionate about horses, then you can let us know. And we, are, we would love to collaborate more with the members and also make your ideas and your dreams come true. Because it's a community and we want to build it together. Thank you everyone for your attention. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can also use the email equine at ivsa.org. You can use Facebook or you can contact us via Instagram. We answer everywhere, every day. So I cannot wait to hear from you. I hope you could hear me <laughs> the whole time when I was talking. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Susanna, for your wonderful presentation and valuable time. <laughs> Uh, I would like to inform all of you that if you have any questions regarding the topic of presentation, you can ask. Thank you for a comment. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please just write them in the chat or you can just email me or you can send it on Facebook or on Instagram, as I said. No, no rush. We can talk yeah. with colleagues if there's no questions. Saying none, we shall proceed further to our program. Uh, I would like to call our next speaker, Ms. Catherine Aras, event manager, IBC Equine Community, for her presentation and to share her experience. Thank you, Ms. So Catherine. Much. Thank yeah. you, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm just going to try and share my screen now. But it doesn't seem to be working. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for the introduction. So I'm gonna to speak today a bit about like how to approach a case of colic, but I'm not an expert, you know, I don't know everything and I would like it to be more of like a discussion and I would like people to participate. So if you want to, like feel free to put your video on and like you know, we can just discuss things through it if you have any questions just unmute yourself um or put them in the chat but this presentation will work better if people participate in the presentation and you know like we're all students we're all learning so it, you know there's not really a wrong answer so anyway here we go i'm not like i said i'm not an expert so if other people no more, I want to share more with us, then please teach us all. So, okay. So to start with, I think when it comes to colic, it's really important to start with the basics and gaining a thorough history and clinical exam is like paramount. If you don't do that, then you, you might just go down the wrong road completely. Like uh, for example, if you don't take the temperature of a horse, and then the temperature is elevated that would change your differentials completely like you would no longer be looking at colic and you might think you know it's a fever of unknown origin i've seen cases like that before that present a referring vet present like thought that they had colic and it came and we did a full clinical like a full colic workup on it in the hospital then we took its temperature and it had an abscess under its jaw where it, like, it had a bit of wood penetrating its jaw. So, you know, always just do a thorough clinical exam and make sure that there's nothing else that you've missed. Uh, and be systematic with your clinical exam and your history taking because especially when we are just starting, if you're systematic, then there's less likely 
you're less likely to miss things. And another thing that is really important to remember as part of your history is your signal mint, because again, that will change your differentials. Like if you've got an older gelding that's like 16 years old, you might be thinking strangulating lipoma, but if you have stallion, you might be thinking inguinal hernia. So just remember your signal mint. It's not moving on. Okay, so this is just a slide, like a revision slide. So just to start with, we're going to start with history taking and there are three elements to important elements to history taking. So what is the history of this specific colic? Uh, what is the management history of the horse? And what's the medical history of the horse? So to start with the colic history, it's important when you're taking history to ask yourself, what questions are you going to ask and why are you asking those questions? You need to understand what you're going to gain from the questions for the questions to be valuable. And this, and also with taking your history at the yard, you know, if you've arrived at horse and it's in the stable and you're taking history from the owner, it's also quite a good opportunity to just look around, look at the surroundings. What's the horse's stable look like? Do the feces look normal to you? That kind of thing. It's a good opportunity to do that. So to start with the colic questions, questions like when was your horse last seen normal allow you to identify the duration of, of the colic, uh, what signs are exhibited specifically, and from that you can gain the severity of colic. Are they eating normally? Are they still interested in food? If they're still interested in food, then they're less likely to be painful and have like gastric distension if they, um, which I mean, is not always the case, but it's quite a good indicator of that. Are the feces normal, both the quantity and the consistency because you can have a horse with colic signs and and you know you might be thinking is that like it's got bad colic signs and it's like a strangulating lesion but it actually has my screen's just gone okay it actually has a it actually has colitis can everyone still see this just because my screen went funny no i can't see it. it's not sure not there Okay, let's try again. It was... Is that it back? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um. Yeah, so, yeah, like a colitis. I don't know where I was. Yeah, consistency. And also looking at the consistency of the feces can be helpful because if they've got long, like long... um strands of hay in them like not completely like you know if their teeth are bad and they've not chewed that well and you might be thinking and they're dry you might be thinking more like an impaction um so I think that's it for there so if we go on to the next okay and again for the management aspect it's important to understand what feed they're on and do they have access to pasture that's important because with increased stabling um and with stabling in general they have a higher risk of impaction so they would usually first of all you get a pelvic flexure impaction is the most common then a cecal impaction and then a gastric impaction and also if they have access to pasture because if they do then one of your other differentials would be grass sickness and what is their normal diet? Uh, because if like in the US, they have Bermuda grass and that is associated with ileal impactions and alpha alpha hay, you get entroliths with that. So just small things that are indicators of different diseases are quite important to know, as well as have there been any recent changes because the horse's GI tract is susceptible to changes and um, and by changes we would say like in the or this is how I've learned it is we term that in the, the last three weeks so you know if it was changed six months ago it's probably not associated with that um and then concentrates like have they got out the feed room and they've just like you know got out of their stable gone into the feed room and just like engulfed everything and you know then that's a risk for colic as well and their deworming history so if they've recently been dewormed then you might be thinking about an ascrid impaction but also with the lack of worming then that's associated with colitis 
and tapeworms. T tapeworms cause ileal impactions and interceptions and strong strongulus fulgaris. I can't say any of these words. <laughs> um, cause non-strangulating infarctions. And then dental, when was the last routine dental is important to determine um, because if it is an increased time from the last dental, then there is a risk of large colon impaction because they're just not able to masticate the food properly. So like you can see here, this horse is well overdue a dental with the sharp enamel points along here. And was there anything abnormal reported at the dental, which may, you know, make it, make the horse unable to chew the food adequately or also you know it is a common problem that it, like vets will go out dentists will go out and maybe just take off slightly too much and and if you do over rasp them then that is a risk of impaction and if a vet over rasps or a dentist over rasps a horse's teeth then they they should tell the owner you know like mistakes happen you just need you know deal with them when they do but yeah, so that's the thing we'll establish from that. So questions about the medical history. So has the horse experienced colic previously? Um, and have there been any previous surgeries? So this just allows you to um, identify whether they have, whether it might be like adhesions caused by the surgery and they might require surgery again or is the occurrence of the same kind of colic and then just a bit about the previous colic like were the signs similar or completely different like is it a horse that is prone to like having a bit of spasmodic colic you give it some buscapan and it's a, it's fine because then you might you know that they might be like yeah it's colicking and it does this every now and again and like she usually has some buscapan and she goes back to normal you know don't take that just because the owner said she's normally fine you still should do a full full clinical workup but you might you know it's nice to have that association but also but then they might be like no she has colics quite frequently but she's never down in her stable thrashing about um so it's just quite nice to have that history and what medication have they received recently or are they currently on because both non-steroidals and antimicrobials are linked to colitis, non-steroidals specifically to right dorsal colitis. And have they had any orthopedic injuries recently? Because with increased pain, they get cecal impactions. And um, also they'll probably be on stable rest because of the orthopedic injury. And that gives you the increased risk of a pelvic impact impaction. So these questions that I have just given you on the screen here are like questions that you might want to ask me in a bit when we come on to the case. So I will move on to the case. So the idea is now is you put yourself into the position of being an ambulatory vet, you're out on the road, you've gone to visit a horse and before you get out of the car to see the horse, what you're thinking is, the major question here is, do I refer the horse or not? I would say that it's never wrong to refer the horse because a second opinion is never a bad thing. And, you know, if it's late at night and the owners are worried about it and you're worried about it and you're not going to come out and check it in two hours, then you can you can send it to a hospital and it will have, monitor, you know, it'll be monitored. So I would never say that it's wrong. But, you you know, like it's it's a question to ask yourself. So let's start with the case. So you're at the yard, you've taken the horse's heart rate, it's 60, the respirate is 24, temperature is 37.6, the gut sounds are reduced in all four quadrants, and the mucous membranes are pink and the CRT is three seconds. What was missed from this clinical exam? If anybody just wants to answer or put it in the chat. Okay, there's something in the chat. Let's see. Let me see. Pulse rate, yeah, that's one of the one of the really important things is digital pulses because it allows you to 
you know, to see if the horse is endotoxemic already. And also you might go out to a colic and you have to remember that, you know, an owner might call you out and say, my horse is colicking, but it doesn't always mean that the horse, the horse will be colicking and a differential may be laminitis because they, they're like, oh, he's just a bit more dull, like, and just had his head down, but he's not really eating. And they can just be a bit off color if they've got bad laminitis. So digital pulses are really important, both for endotoxemia and to rule out laminitis. Yet yeah, dehydration is also important. There was one, like, um, one, how would you say? It's like one, I, I can't, I don't know how to say it without saying that answer. <laughs> uh, one major kind of group of things. When you go in, what is the first thing that you would do? You go to the horse at the yard before you put the, the stethoscope or take the respirator or anything. Okay, so I think we talked about, like I said, about it a bit earlier, but just like observation, things like just look at the horse's body condition score is quite a good thing to include in your clinical exam and look at the stable for any, um, so that's not so much clinical exam, but you know, for any signs of history, the other, and observation was the clinical exam thing. And just look at the, uh, the horses. I don't know if anyone's ever seen like the typical colic eyes, but they're just like you I don't have a picture on the slide but you just like go you see the horse in the stable and their eyes are just like swollen like they can't open their eyes and they have wounds over their eyes and it you know it's, it's a very typical like this horse has been down colicking all night and needs to be referred like but um they're good things to just look out for and like look for wounds over the body like has it been thrashing around and he's cut his leg and you know it's probably not the biggest issue at the moment but good things to note um especially if you're going to be the only vet seeing him and you're not referring him because you, that may potentially be something that you want to treat as well um okay let's move on so just a bit about the clinical exam so a normal heart rate of a horse was is 20 to 40 beats per minute and abnormal is like you would be concerned in a colic case above 60 beats per minute. Uh, respirate is eight to 16 breaths per minute and that increases with pain. Gut sounds are usually, this is a bit difficult to quantify because it, you have to listen to, to know what is normal, but how we would write it down is like plus in all quadrants is normal. I know some places I think do use plus plus as being normal, but we use plus plus as being like hypermotel plus minus being as redu being reduced and minus being absent. So obviously all of those three are abnormal. Um, temperature, 37.5 to 38.5, which increases with inf inflammatory or infectious processes. So inflammatory, you would just expect it to be at the high end of normal, whereas infectious processes that you can see them like uh, up to 40, like, 40 degrees um, or higher, but then you're worried. Um, mucous membrane should be pink and moist and the CRT should be less than two seconds. Um, abnormal is, you know, like tacky and with the CRT above uh, two seconds and like that would show um, that your peripheral perfusion is not good. But also you get like the toxic line around their gums. It's just like a red lying around their teeth and that is uh, in indicative of endotoxemia. A normal body condition score is three on the one to five scale, uh, four over four, is, four and over is obese and two and under is emaciated. Digital pulses, that is very dependent on horse breed type because if you have a cob with huge feathers, you're probably not going to be able to feel its pulses. But if you have a thoroughbred with little skinny legs, then you can probably feel its pulses, but they won't be bounding usually. And if you compare them to, I mean, if they all, all four of them are bounding, that's not helpful. But usually, like if you put your fingers on the pulses, that you, you'd be able to tell if they were bounding. But um, that's also experience and that's uh, endotoxemia. 
would show that. I don't find digital books as the easiest myself, to be honest. And observation, norm, uh, like, you know, is the horse normal in the stable? You know, just looks like a normal horse or is up and down and rolling and, you know, going like it's in pain um, or are there signs of trauma on the eyes and limbs, which we spoke about. So this is the opportunity now where you can ask me so that we can determine what is wrong with the case. You can ask me some of the history questions that I gave you earlier and I will tell you more about the case. So I'm the owner and you're the vet. If you want to ask me some history questions. Anything, anything that you would ask an owner. You don't even know the horse's name yet, so. No one has any questions? Age, um, 16. No, it's never a colic before. It doesn't, it, he's had like some respiratory issues. I think he had like some sort of like asthma thing, but other than that, he's never had any problems. He's a warm blood. Uh, usually he eats all of his hay, but overnight I put him in the stable last night and today he hasn't, uh, like he hasn't finished his hay net. Feces, yeah, the feces, the consistency of the feces is normal. They he passed two droppings overnight and they, they seem normal. Okay, they're all really good questions. Can you explain what you mean by abnormal sounds? Like, is that a question to the vet or, or to? the owner Descent. no it seem fine there's nothing in the rest of them not that I know about anyway there's just a couple of horses here so yeah he's a uh, oh sounds right yeah sorry I get it now um yeah he's he's seems really painful like since i've been here this morning he's been up and down and rolling and kicking at his belly and he, he's all, usually just like calm and stands in the stable nicely and, but he hasn't i don't i don't think that he he doesn't seem lethargic he just seems very painful and very agitated but his breathing's normal now nothing Nothing that I've noticed anyway. Okay, shall we move on? I think that they're all really good questions. Um, the thing that I would say about distension of the abdomen. So I think that, I think that maybe it's, it's a bit distended, but I haven't really taken his rug off fully this morning, so I don't know. So I think, that that is a perfect example like of when you're asking an owner things like that's you know that's important to ask but don't you know the owner won't be lying but like that lack of knowledge like make sure that you double check things for yourself and just look at the horse like do you think that it's exhibiting signs of pain and like feces consistency like that's really important but owners tend to give like quite they can give quite vague answers so even if you've just like asked what feed is the horse consumed then they just might be like well it's consumed it's hay but you you want to be specific you're like is this normal like has it is this a normal amount of hay that it it usually eats overnight and like passing droppings like I said it had two state two droppings and it's stable but like does it usually pass two droppings or does it usually pass like 10 like what is what's normal for and an owner might not know that if they're a livery but um yeah I think that they're all really good questions uh, he's not been out of the stable this morning so I don't know if he's walking properly because um he's just been like in up and down and up and down so I haven't I haven't moved him from the stable 
Okay, so these are still the vets, but let's move on. I think that there is another question. But yeah, so you're at you're now the vet at the yard. What further diagnostics do you want to do? I've given three very good clues on the screen and pictures. So. I don't know what, I don't know what that diagnostic technique is. I've never heard of it. Has anyone ever, has, does anyone want to explain it to me? Maybe we use a different name. No. Okay, let me search, I can search it up. If see if we use different name, but I don't know where my hmm. that's no idea. Okay, well while I'm searching that up, maybe people can answer the question that I have on the screen. Oh, oh, I just gave you the answer, didn't I? I can try. I don't know if <laughs> this is going great. So now, does anyone have any ideas? Maybe maybe that is one of them, but I've never heard of that. I want to search it up, but I don't know. I just... Have you ever heard of that, Zoo? Have you heard of this, the technique? Sorry, can you repeat? Because I just got a, a one minute call from work. <laughs> oh, in the chat, there's, there's about like a, I don't even know how, I don't know how to pronounce it, but like a, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm not oh, gonna try. I'm Diagnostic technique that I've never heard of. Have you heard of it? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Google it quickly. Yeah, yeah, maybe I was trying to, but I can't find where my device is. So. Anyway, we'll come back to that question. So I'll give everyone another minute to see if you can answer what further diagnostics you want to perform. Yeah, rectal, that's one of them, perfect. Very important. Fecal, so do you mean like a sand test? Like you can do a sand test in the ER, definitely. That's not something that I was gonna speak about today, but yes, it's important. Two others. You've got a horse with a very elevated heart rate. What is the first thing that you would think that you want to do? Remembering an elevated heart rate is associated with pain. Okay, let's ultrasound that abdominal palpation. So, yeah, I think that I don't know pH of the abdomen or I've never heard of that like please tell us more I don't know I don't know anything about testing pH of the abdomen or of the feces I don't know sorry what you're testing the pH of or if pH stands for something that I haven't of the of the blood so Yes, yeah, so I don't think that we typically typically test pH, but yes. So yes, the blood, both the blood and ultrasound are really important, but I would say that when you're out on the yard and not in a hospital, then you can't, um, you won't have, you know, you won't have your hematology and biochemistry machine there. And the likelihood is on the road vets also won't have an ultrasound. 
So the three techniques that I, we will come to those later, but the three techniques that I'm going to speak about, yes, that's a really important one, nasogastric intubation. Perfect. So these are the three that I'm going to speak about now. Move on. So useful diagnostic techniques at the yard are analgesia, rectal examination, and nasogastric intubation. So we'll start with analgesia. So this may be required to just assess the horse, but it can also be used as a diagnostic. And it's a really important diagnostic because if a horse colics through flinixin, then that, that's very serious. Because um, flinix, the, the two the two analgesias that we use in the UK that I've seen used are flinixin, which you use at 1.1 mg per kg IV, and it's more potent. And any signs of discomfort through flinixin are very, are, you know, are very serious because flinixin is very potent. And um, because flinixin is very potent, you shouldn't refeed a horse until 24 hours after the last dose of flinixin because there might be something going on um but you don't know because the flinixin has like you know taken away all the pain so there's no signs and um and then you're refeeding it but actually it has a blockage um 24 hours later the one that's not had flinixin and then it's showing signs of pain again so just don't refeed until it's had 24 hours no flinixin that would be an exception. The only exception to that would be post colic surgery when they may be on flinixin for pain relief. Um, but, you know, we're speaking about diagnostics, so it's different. Um, and then phenylbutazone, which you, is 4.4 mg per kg IV and it is less potent, but can be used. And you might use it initially because you don't want to give them flinixin because you don't want to mask signs of colic because that's what flinixin does. And there are cases that I have seen that will come in and they've already had flinixin by the referring vet and the referring vet, well, they still don't really look right. And in the hospital, the clin, you know, the clinician, you have to be very aware that because they've had um, flinixin, they might just not look right because but they're actually in severe pain. So what I forgot to ask earlier, which is another question for everyone, is if you get to the yard and the horse is thrashing around in the stable and you want to examine the horse, what sedation would you give it to allow you to do that? What would be your first choice? Our drugs might be called with different names actually, but we can, we can go with it, try. You can just speak out loud as well. You don't have to put it in the chat. I'd say you can put your hand up, which you can also do, but I'm not gonna promise that I can pronounce your name right. <laughs> yes, xylazine, perfect. And why would you use xylazine? Dexmedetonamidine, I'd, so, okay. This is, okay, yeah, there we go. Um. I do, I've never seen that used in horses. We just used detomidine, but I think that it's used quite a lot in small animals and is almost like, you know, you can use it in exchange for detomidine. But is there any reason that you would use xylazine above detomidine or dexmedetonamidine? Does anyone know why? Okay, so it's just because it's short acting, so it's 20 minutes um, and it's quite a good time frame for you to just be able to examine the horse and decide, you know, you might then decide that it needs to be sedated more and then you give it some um, Dom and Torb, but I think xylazine is a good one to start with. Okay, so analgesia is your first diagnostic. If they, if they call it through analgesia, then especially for flinix in, then it's serious and you probably want to refer them. Okay, moving on to the next, which is rectal examination. So safety first, safety is really important. So you have to make sure that the horse is adequately restrained and that might be using a twitch, which you can see in this picture here, or um, 
sedating the horse. And you will also administer, usually you administer buscopan, which is an antispasmolytic, and that just relaxes everything, abdomen, makes it easier for you to rectal them and makes it easier for, um, and, and like makes it more comfortable for them as well. So how to perform a rectal exam. So this is what I've been taught and how I've been talked through it, but I've never, I've only rectal like one or two horses. So I don't know what I'm really speaking about here, but this is, I know these anatom, th this anatomy is correct, but I don't have clinical experience of this. But again, I would say be systematic because if you're systematic, then you can't miss anything. I just think it's really important. Like as new graduates and all the way through, really, if you're systematic, then there's like, you're less likely to make mistakes. So, um, so for the rectal, if you feel dorsally as you go in, you should be able to feel the aorta. You go down to the left-hand side, then you should be able to feel the spleen and the spleen should sit like against the body wall. If there is anything between the spleen and the body wall, then that could be a nephrosplenic entrapment, which is just where a bit of gut has been caught in the nephrosplenic space. And you should also be able to feel the kidney. Uh, and then you should feel ventrally and you should be able to feel the pelvic flexure and it should be like a doughy consistency. But if it's, you know, if it's hard or if as, as soon as you go in, like you feel the pelvic flexure, then you probably have a pelvic flexure impaction. And then on the right hand side, you should be able to feel a band of the cecum, but what's abnormal there is you shouldn't be able to feel uh, um, any like any distension of the cecum you might have like a cecal torsion or a cecal impact impaction you shouldn't be able to feel the any tenial bands um, you might be thinking you know in that area you might be thinking like a dorsal displacement so the things that you're looking for on oh and then most importantly like ventral um and like for feeling for any um, distended small intestine because, and if you have, if you can feel small intestine and rectal, then it's always abnormal. So yeah, what the three main things that you're looking for is your impaction. So, and specifically, you know, the most common one is the pelvic flexure. So feeling for that on the left ventral displacements. Um, so is everything in the right place, uh, which I'm sure that just comes with, practice you know the, the more rectals you do the more you know what is normal um and I think that's something else that I've been taught like if you go out to a colic but you you don't know if it warrants a rectal if the horse seems like you're not going to cause it in any injury and it's not going to cause you injury then it's good to rectal everything because it's good to know what's normal and what's you know to know what's abnormal you need to know what's normal and then small int intestinal distension which is important. But it's important to remember also when you're doing a rectal examination that you can only feel 20% of the horse's abdomen. So there could be something going on that you aren't able to feel. And also it might just be at the point that you still can't feel it. Like, or, you know, there's no small intestinal distension yet, but that doesn't mean that there's not a strangulating lesion because it's just, you know, it's just not got to the point the disease hasn't progressed that far yet. Um, but taking a rectal, like doing a rectal exam is quite a nice baseline. Like if you do it at the start and then it, you know, if, it, if it's an impaction say, and you're just going to treat it at home and giving it lots of fluids, um, then it's quite a good like baseline of this is what felt like now I'm going out the day later to recheck on it. I'm going to do another rectal. Does it, you know, does it feel better? Is it more doughy? Is it still quite hard and the feces abnormal? Like that kind of thing. Okay. So with rectal examination, there's two major risks. And one of those is the rectal tear. To mitigate that, you have appropriate restraint, which is what I spoke about earlier, whether using a twitch or um, sedation. And also, you know, is the person that is handling handling the horse suitable to do so in this case and if you think it's too like if not then you know just don't do it um and then relaxation which is your buscopan um 
The risk is increased if you have a stallion, an Arab, they're very small or they're dehydrated, uh, which again is just, you know, don't probably don't try and rectal like a 18 month old colt that's like flying around the stable because it's probably not going to end well. Uh, but if you do cause a rectal tear, like you come out and on your glove, there is blood don't panic um the first thing to do is inform the owner what's happened and let your boss know just for insurance purposes anyway in the uk that's kind of what the protocol is um and in like less severe cases you can administer antibiotics and you want to make the make sure that they've reduced the straining and fecal contamination so you can do this by giving them epi, like doing an epidural anesthesia or rectal packing or giving them buscapan. Uh, but if they're grade two and above, then refer them um, for different management at hospital. And the second major risk is safety, injury, like injury to yourself. So just, just make sure that what you're doing is safe. And if it's not safe, don't do it. <laughs> <clears throat> this is just like so that you can use it for your own learning purposes. It's the rectal tear grading scale. Okay, next one is nasogastric intubation. So it's really important, and I think that it should be done in every case. Like, like I've seen, I've seen places that don't, but like I, that's just personally, I think it's really valuable diagnostic and um and can be life-saving but again the same with this make sure that you have appropriate restraint so sedated twitch whatever you need make sure it's safe um and there are cases in which you should do the um nasogastric intubation immediately before you do anything else so like if you arrive at a horse and it's got reflux coming from its nostril then you should intubate um and get the reflux but it's also if you're in the clinic and the heart rates and and the and the um you have gastric dilation on ultrasound then it's something that you want to do immediately is pass the tube and again if you've got a heart rate over 60 then you want to be um quite quickly um intubating so what do you need for this? You need a stomach tube, a jug, a bucket of water, an empty bucket to catch the reflux in and lubrication. Um, and so you will have the stomach tube, just put, make sure you put lubrication on it. You want to make sure you're in the ventral meatus so that you don't cause uh, a nosebleed. So you'll just, you can put your thumb or your finger into the ventral meatus and then put your tube underneath it and just make sure you keep pushing down on that into the ventral meatus until you get to the line as it's marked here. And that will mean that you're then at the larynx and then you want to either push their head in so it changes the orientation of the larynx or stimulate them to like swallow. And once they've swallowed, you know, you can, you can pass the tube into the esophagus. And once you're in the esophagus, it, you should you should go with no resistance but make sure you like blow on the end of the tube so blow air into the esophagus before you push into the esophagus because you don't want to take like chunks out of the esophagus you just want to push it down nice and smoothly without I mean you're gonna you're gonna cause irritation but try and minimize it as much as possible something that I always find it really difficult to remember which meatus I should be in. So um, I found it really helpful to remember central and ventral because that's where you want it to be. I just like, I, I don't know, it just worked for me. Um, so once you're, then you usually have another line in the tube to indicate you're in the stomach. And once you're hit resistance, that probably means that you're at the end of the stomach um, and you can start searching for the reflux and you can use that by by creating a siphon or sometimes like it will just come on its own without you having to put any fluid in to create a siphon. So my next question is, what is a normal quantity of reflux for a horse that doesn't have colic, normal horse? I don't know. Thank you. 
just guess any number. Three liters. Does anyone have any other guesses? Okay, so three liters, like, you know, maybe we're like we're taught differently. I'm sure we've been taught two liters. So yeah, 2.5. So yeah, so less than two is what we're we're taught, but I, you know, three might not be that significant as well. So if you have if you have anything three and above, maybe even two and a half, then that would be, you know, that would be considered if you have two and a half liters reflux that would be considered actual reflux of half a liter uh, is what we would say here but that might may vary in what you're taught in different places so the risks of nasogastric intubation are first one is tracheal intubation so it's just really important to make sure that um that you're in the esophagus and not the trachea, especially before you put anything down the tube. If you're going to put water, you can put a little bit and you'll be okay, but anything else can cause an aspiration. You, you could even cause an aspiration in your just by going down the trachea. But um, you want definitely, if you're treating an impaction with mineral oils, you don't want to put the mineral oils into the lungs because that will be fatal. So just make sure that you're in the esophagus. Um, if you go into the trachea, then they usually like the ones that I've seen, they just like cough and cough. And, like, you know, it's usually, it usually is quite obvious, but I'm sure it's not in cases as well. So, um, and, and the other one is hemorrhage from the ethmoid turbinates. And you can just avoid that by making sure you're ventral and central. I remember it, central and ventral, whichever. Um, and the trauma to the retropharyngeal recess or the esophagus, as I'm sure you would like, you know, that as you, you if you're, if they're refluxing for like five days post-surgery, then it, you're causing irritation to the esophagus. So just try and minimize that by using lots of lubrication and be gentle. And especially if they're dehydrated, it's a risk. And gastric rupture. So if you leave anything in um and just make sure you're calculating what's going in and what's going out and and how much you're putting in because if you leave too much in the stomach then you could cause it to rupture so don't leave too much in <laughs> okay so back to the case you've administered flinexin and your horse is still exhibiting signs of colic they have reflux of three liters there's no abnormalities found on rectal do you want to refer the case Mineral oils. I've never seen mineral oils used, and I've heard different opinions about them. But no, have you? Do you use them? You can discuss that at the same time as you don't want to refer the case, or you don't use mineral oils. Which one? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not like in some. I've seen it done you know they do it in some cases and not in other cases but i just think that it's really important yeah maybe i will see it out loud because it's faster uh we honestly i think czech republic where i'm actually where i'm now at they are known for not doing nasogastric intubation almost at all when i when wherever i was right. in in spain or in poland or in vienna uh in austria sorry they they all do nasogastric intubation routinely with every colic case. But here in Czech Republic, where I'm now, and they don't do it unless they see content on the ultrasound in the stomach. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not I'm not in the field with the um yeah. with the field vet, but in the clinic they never use it. So the and the mineral oils no never. Yeah, I've never seen mineral oils used either. I think um, like years, years ago, maybe even in Vienna. I think they used paraffin oil, but I, yeah. think, I didn't hear many good opinions about it. Yeah, I've not heard good opinions either. I've, but yeah, the same as you really. So, okay, so we've decided that we're gonna refer the case. 
Yes, exactly. So the reasons for the referring the case, I think, would be because we have three litres of reflux, which, you know, is that significant or not? Who knows? But our cutoff usually is two litres. And the main thing is that he's not responsive to clinics. And I think that's a very important indicator. So if you're going to refer the case, which we've decided in this case we are, then make sure what you should do before you do that is you should speak to the hospital, make sure they have a full history, everything that you know about the horse, and see if they will give you an estimation, like a quote, so that you can then prepare the client for how much it's going to cost them. And in terms of the horse, just stabilize them for um, transport. So you can give them some more analgesia or even sedate them with um, Domtorb. Uh, you can leave the nasogastric tube in and then it just um, acts as a one-way valve so the reflux can come out, but nothing can go back in as long as you put a glove on the end of the tube. And fluid therapy, which you can, you know, like someone suggested earlier, um, make sure you look at their hydration status and if the horse is dehydrated, then you can give them IV fluids or enteral fluids, but you want don't want to give them mental fluids if you think that they have a small intestinal obstruction. Okay. So, do you, you stop the bleeding when you cause a hemorrhage? Yeah, so when I've seen it, I have caused a horse to bleed before and, and when you just carry on like you just carry on tubing and the horse stops bleeding and everything's fine like it is really common like if if you're tubing a horse for five six days straight for you know like every four hours then they're they're gonna be inflamed and and it's really easy to even I think cause a nosebleed without being in the without being in the wrong place um I don't know if I was in the wrong place or not but um yeah, when when it's happened, like you ju just let it keep, just let it bleed while you do the nasogastric, like looking for reflux, and then they usually stop, and that's fine. I suppose it's a problem if they don't stop, then you need to investigate that further. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll speak up because it's again faster. But have you ever seen a like a severe bleeding? I I've I've seen them twice in my life. One of them was in Spain, and the horse was referred to surgery, and the doctor didn't ask us to stop the bleeding. It just he just let it bleed until it stopped it, itself during the surgery. But it was really prolonged, like half an hour bleeding, but really severe. And then here in Czech Republic, we also had a case, and and the horse was severely bleeding, and and they were like you know half of the box was full of blood. And uh, but they were trying to to stop it um, hardly. How so, did they try and stop it? What well, <laughs> putting the uh, tampon from paper tower <laughs> and 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 keeping the head elevated. But it was a bit scary to me because like if it goes, I don't know, you know, if it goes down the track here or I don't know, it was bleeding bleeding yeah. severely. So I'm not sure because I saw it twice in two different countries and both of them did different thing. And I don't know what's the protocol actually. Yeah, I don't know. I've never seen it. So I've never seen them with prolonged yeah. bleeding. Like that. usually they, the ones that I have seen, they've had a nosebleed and I tried to find it. Find it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure to be honest. Sorry. That's fine. Um, thank you. So now change your mindset and you're the vet at the at a referral hospital. And you're going to, instead of working up the case with the important question of being do I refer or don't I refer it? Your important question is, is it a surgical case or is it a non-surgical case? So this might be easier if we just quickly review the classification, which is just, a, I'm just going to show you a list of colics. So you can get small intestinal colics, just simple obstruction and strangulating obstructions, small intestine, you can have impactions, mesocolon, ruptures or rectal tears, cecum, you can have cecal impactions, cecal torsions and intersusceptions, the large colon, you can have simple obstructions and you can have strangulating obstructions. So the ones that I have highlighted are the ones that you would consider surgical management. Okay, so 
What does a full colic workup include in the in the clinic now? You're in the hospital. And I think, yeah, I didn't give you any clues this time, but you do have the ones that we did before that you're going to repeat. So. I think one of them was said before as well, actually. Yep, all of those, definitely. Anything else? Yeah, so you would place a catheter if you think it's surgical. I mean, you would you could say that you place a catheter in all cases, but at the clinic that I the clinic that I've been at, it's not been standard. Like if they're going to surgery, then you'll place a catheter. And I suppose if they're an impaction, you could as well because if you're gonna give them IV fluids, but I think that enteral fluids are better for impactions, but yeah. Does anyone else have any any suggestions? No, I think that I, I to be honest, most of the cases that I've seen come into the clinic will be um, have been surgical, but the ones that aren't surgical we don't place a catheter unless we think that they need IV fluids. So yes, if you're going to treat them medically, but not on IV fluids, then yeah, probably without a catheter. So if you're just going to be tubing them oral fluids or there, I've seen cases where they just come in for monitor because um, the owner, you know, can monitor them over of course during the day then he looked out really not questions but yeah if you have questions you can ask those as well uh does anyone have any other answers for the work up okay let's Let's move on so that everyone doesn't fall asleep. So full colic workup would include repeating your clinical exam, doing blood analysis, ultrasonography, abdominal paracentesis, nasogastric intubation and rectal. So the clinical exam, the nasogastric intubation and the rectal have already been done, but they're by the referring vet who isn't you anymore. It's just, so they have just told you what they found but it's always important to repeat them again for yourself because these they all could have changed um, within the time it's traveled to the clinic. So in our case, we did uh, the full clinical exam to what was observed by the referring vet. The blood analysis, we did PC, we did PC, uh, Lactate three millimoles per liter. Hematology was within normal limit. Ultrasound, you saw small intestine, intestine with a five centimeter diameter. Um, on your peritoneal tap, it was red. Your lactate was twelve millimoles per liter. Your total protein was four grams per liter. Nasogastric infusion, you got five liters of reflux. On on rectal, you felt distended small intestine. So. The next question is, what is your interpretation of these findings? Anything. Do you think it's normal, it's abnormal? Um, minutes okay. yes reflux is abnormal definitely the wall was normal 
thickness, um, peristalsis would be reduced. Yeah, definitely abnormal. Do you know what normal is for the abdominal paracentesis? I just got peritoneal taps. <laughs> what would you expect to expect to see? Okay. Yes, it should be yellow. Definitely. Red is red is bad. So here's just a quick overview. So a PCV normal should be 30 to 40. In our case, it was 43. So that's slightly increased and it's probably due to dehydration and it will be decreased with anemia. Total protein normal is 55 to 70 grams per liter. And that is usually increased with dehydration and decreased with colitis or peritonitis. But you have to be careful with that because when you're taking total protein, you're getting both albumin and globulin. So you might have like, if you have a hypo, like protein albuminemia, then if you have like a protein losing enteropathy, then um, the the albumin might be low, but you're having increased globulins because you have dehydration and that levels out. So just, just remember that when you're reading the results. Lactate should be less than two millimoles per liter. And if it's increased, that is increased because of hypoxia, anemia, dehydration, obstruction of blood supply or bacterial production, hematology, usually on the hematology screen it will machine it will show you like what is not within normal limits but with a colic a non-specific acute colic you might see like a stress leukogram so increased neutrophils and decreased lymphocytes and also if you see uh, a neutropenia then that would indicate and you, you may be getting a colitis and you might want to isolate that case and thinking of things like salmonella um, and then biochemistry, again, the same with it should show you what's what's normal on the machine. Um, but what you might be looking for is increased creatinine with dehydration or renal injury, electrolyte imbalance if you've got loss in diarrhea or reflux, an increase in indirect bilirubin, which happens when they're starved, like they've not been eating. Uh, liver parameters may be elevated due to bile obstruction, so like with a right dorsal displacement or distended duodenum. Okay. And so if we just go back to them, we had an increased PCV, probably due to dehydration, an increased total protein, probably due to dehydration. Our blood lactate was slightly increased, and that could be due to any of these, maybe hy hypoxia in the um, abdomen, and then our hematology and biochemistry were normal. So ultrasonography, let's start. So just to prepare your horse for ultrasound, um, as long as you have permission from the owner, you can clip them and scrub them. And then we use like, I've seen spirit used. Uh, if you don't have permission, then just soak them in spirit. <laughs> um, but if they're going to go to surgery, the likelihood is you do have permission to clip them. And B, I don't know if that, maybe someone can tell me if that works the same. Like, you know, we have to gain permission to clip someone's horse. I don't know if that works the same in all countries. Um, but the same with ultrasound, be systematic so that you don't miss everything. And I'm just going to hear, I'm just going to cover like the key points to focus on um, if you're just going to do a quick ultrasound but you can examine like the whole abdomen. So if we start on the left hand side and caudally you start with the nephrosplenic space so that's up here you should be able to see the kidney 
and the spleen next to it, the spleen should be on the, against the body wall. Then you should be able to see the kidney. But if you can't see the kidney or you see the colon instead of the kidney, then that um, indicates uh, nephrosplenic entrapment. Uh, and that is, so you can usually see it on the 17th intercostal space or behind the last rib. Uh, if you do have a nephrosplenic entrapment, then that is usually felt on rectal, but their peritoneal tap is usually normal and it's most common in large breed horses and like warm bloods. And then we'll move on to the stomach, which you should be able to see between the 8th and the 12th intercostal space. And you're just looking for distension of the stomach. So it should just be like the middle third. So if the height is an indicator of distension as well as the length. So um, over four intercostal spaces and kind of major things in the stomach that you'd be thinking about is a gastric impaction or just like distension. Like, do you need to reflux the horse? Um, then ventrally, like in the inguinal area, you look for small intestine, you look at their motility, their distension, uh, the wall thickness so the small intestine should be motile, like motile and you should be able to see normal paracelsis where they're just like moving you know nicely and distension of the lumen they should be four centimeters so any no anything they should be less than four centimeters so anything more than that is abnormal and the wall thickness should be less than four millimeters and more than that um is like a dematis and this can help help you distinguish whether the gut is viable which I mean obviously it's not as good of an indicator as visually seeing the gut but can be can be used as that okay and then move on to the right hand side and the major things that you can so again here like you can look for the right kidney and you can look at the liver just about I hope you can see my mouse just here like cranially um but then two specific areas that you can focus on are the colon so you should have a wall thickness of less than four millimeters if you have an increased wall thickness then this might indicate colitis or volvulus and if you have blood vessels so here is a typical blood vessel and they're like referred to as turtles, like they look like little turtles, but the blood vessels on the colon should all run axially. So you shouldn't be able to see them in ultrasound and because they shouldn't run like along the body wall, they should be too deep. Um, and so if you can see them, it usually means you have a displacement, but um, it means you have a displacement because you know, the colon's like flip round. And the other thing you can look at is the duodenum and look at the thickness. So again, it's a section of the small intestine. So you can look at the thickness and it should be less than four centimeters um, and less than four millimeters. I think something that it can also be an indicator of if the horse needs reflux because the distension from the stomach can go back into the duodenum. Uh, something, and it should be seen between the 14th and the 15th intercostal space. Um, but it, something that I found really useful as a tip that someone taught me was if you draw an imaginary line between the hip here and the elbow and it should just be in the middle of, the, of that line so somewhere along there which I always found quite useful to help me remember that. Okay so the next one is abdominal paracentesis so this can be done blind or it can be done ultrasound guided. Another tip that I was taught is if you're going to do it blind, then you want to do it at the lowest point of the abdomen. So if you um, like squirt some spirit on the abdomen, wherever a drop comes off, that will be the lowest point. So it's a good area to go in. Um, it requires, and the other thing is, is make sure that if you're doing like, if you're, especially if you're doing it not ultrasound guided, but uh, try and do it um, this side right of midline so that you miss the spleen on the left. Um, and aseptic preps, so clip and then prep 
aseptically. You can use a 19, 18 gauge needle. I've also seen a 19 gauge needle use two inch, or you can use a teat cannula where you do like a stab incision and do it that way. Uh, and then you catch the peritoneal fluid in EDTA or plain tubes. The risk of this is enterocentesis or peritonitis. Um, so what you're looking at when you're looking at the peritoneal fluid is the appearance, the total protein, the white blood cells and the lactate. So this is just a little table to show you what's normal and what is strangulating. So the appearance is usually, it should be colorless or, or a light yellow and clear. Um, total protein should be less than 20 grams per liter. White blood cell should be less than five times 10 to the liter and lactate should be less than two millimoles per liter. Strangulating, you will have red serosanguinous um, above 20, above five and above two. Uh, so we can see from this that in our case, the abdominal paracentesis is indicative of a strangulating lesion. I think I've just seen something come in on the chat. Let's have a look. What's the purpose of the EDTA? I think that you can, so with the EDTA, you can just, you can test the PCV um, in the abdomen. Okay, oh, oh yeah, this is. So what is the final consensus, surgical or non-surgical? What does everyone think? Tell us in the chat. So we've got our distended small intestine. We have a strangulate, our peritoneal tap is indicative of a strangulating lesion. Um, we have five liters of reflux. The horse is slightly dehydrated. I think those are the main problems that we've established so far. I think what I didn't say actually is what I've also it won't let me go back. I can't click on it because it'll show the answer. <laughs> but I'll just speak while, while somebody decides whether it's surgical or non-surgical. Um, but with an increased PCV, you have a decreased survival rate. And with an increased lactate, you also have... A, you, with an increased lactate, you also... A de, an increased lactate, you also have an increased... A decreased survival rate. The answer to the peritoneal fluid, it we don't have a peritonitis, so there's no neutrophils or anything. Um, we just have a very high lactate of 12. So that's the other thing that is really good to do is to compare the lactate in the abdomen to the lactate of the blood. And the lactate in the abdomen is more than two times the lactate in the blood, then that's a poor prognostic indicator. But so our peritoneal fluid is red um, and I can't remember. Yes, surgery. Okay, perfect. Why? So surgical. Why is it surgical and what classification slash localization of the lesion of lesion could these findings fit with? Are there, is there anything specific that you're thinking of? Which I mean, I think we have, no, so the surgical, so, so are you saying that we would do surgery, but after we correct the dehydration? Yes, yeah, so we definitely, definitely surgical. I have, you know, I think that it's not severely dehydrated, like a PCV of 43 isn't worrying really. So I think that you wouldn't correct, you know, you wouldn't correct the, um, you wouldn't correct the, the dehydration before taking it to surgery. So, sorry, I get so distracted when another thing comes on the chat. Um, so yes, all of those are correct. How is the glucose and do we have acidosis? So 
we don't have either of those. But if somebody wants to speak more about those at the end, please feel free to, because what I have put on the slides is what I've seen at the clinics that I've been at. So um, it, I mean, I think that you see the acidosis on your um, uh, biochemistry, but I have never seen a specific test for that. Yes, so strangulating. Let's move on to the next slide. So we decided to go for surgery and this is what we saw when we went in. Does anybody know what this is? Guess. Yeah, perfect. It's a lipoma. So it's just like an accumulation of fat that, that occurs on the mesentery and then they can just like wrap around and then they wrap, they, they wrap around the intestine and just strangulate. So this was a strangulating lipoma, um, which are more common in older geldings. But I think that also the study that did that was also biased in the fact that it had more older geldings in the study. I, but I don't, you know. I don't know for sure. Um, and so the surgical treatment and then remove the lipomas and any other lipomas that you found in the mesentery. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go through the surgery completely. Like I, I'm not a surgeon, but I can tell you some of the steps and that once you've got out the small intestine, you're going to de you're gonna decompress the small intestine and then assess its viability. So it's, I think in cases that I've seen, they might give it like 10, 15 minutes to see if once it's not strangulated by that lesion anymore, does the intestine look more viable? But I think in this case, you can see that it doesn't look viable. You assess the viability by looking at color, motility, um, and there's one other thing. And yeah, and peri, yeah, motility. So the color and the motility and the thickness when you um, palpate it. So in here, you can see that this is not a normal color at all. It's really congested and non-vital um, motility. That if you flick at the gut, then it, it should move or like some peristalsis and this wasn't at all um, completely non-viable. So a resection and astomosis occurs. So it's important that when you're doing a resection and you're actually entering the gut lumen that you exteriorize everything from the abdomen and make sure it's like sufficiently packed with swabs so that you don't put any gut contents um or contaminate like the abdomen with any bacteria from the gut lumen and cause peritonitis so just make sure everything's exteriorized and clamp the two ends and cut off from where you think is viable i think that it's possible to remove 50 percent of then the small intestine and for like horses to still survive. But if you're looking at more than that, then, you know, it's not, it's not worth it. It's time to put the horse to sleep usually, unfortunately. Um, and then the anastomosis is here. And in this case, they just used simple continuous sutures to suture all the way around um, and post-surgery. Uh, I immediately post-surgery, the horse was on IV fluids and calcium to just help with the electrolyte imbalance and the IV fluids to help with dehydration. There's a five-day course of penicillin at 20 mg per kg BID and gentamicin 6.6 .6 mg per kg, IV SID and flunexin 1.1 mg per kg, IV SID. Um, so it's a five day course because we've entered the lumen in most of the cases that I've seen or the hospitals I worked in it's like a five day course because you've entered the lumen a three day course if you don't so if you just go in and like they have a displacement you just move everything back to the normal place but you don't open the lumen then you just give them a three day course of um, or even if you go in fix strangulation but the abdomen you know it's still viable you're not entering the lumen then you just give them a three day course and change them on to TMPS and Danalon which they normally go home on. Um, 
So what complications do you expect after performing an anastomosis? I'm sure there's loads, but this is just one that I'm, um, that we're focusing on, that I've focused on, that I've seen in most cases where you, where you have performed a resection and anastomosis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that is perfect. Post-operative ileus. So yeah, a lack of peristalsis. And this requires them to be nasogastric tube for refluxing every four hours. And while you're refluxing, the horse shouldn't be reintroduced to food. Food should be reintroduced from 18 hours post-surgery if, um, if they're not refluxing. But if they are, then... No. So my question really is, is what is the cutoff? When do you stop nasogastric intubation for refluxing? Like when should they stop refluxing? And does anybody have an answer to that question? So your horse, we've just had surgery and you're still refluxing at 24 hours. Do you continue or is it time to consider it the end for that horse. Okay, so I don't know. I mean, I don't think that that's an easy question. I don't know the answer to it. I probably need to read more about it and speak to more people about it because I have seen at many hospitals, uh, a couple hospitals are like, 74 hours at uh, 72 hours is like your cutoff you'll keep refluxing for 72 hours but then there's been cases that I've seen that you've refluxed for five days and yeah definitely what the owner agrees to um you like keep refluxing for five days and and then the horse is fine and like you know peristalsis kicks back in and the normal and they go home like and that's great but I think personally I think also what is really important is how is the horse like if the horse is systemically well then you can keep refluxing but if the horse is really miserable and really not not coping and really ill and it's getting to the point where it needs to be refluxed more often rather than you know the reflux is reducing um once you hit like a four day period then then maybe it's time you know to come to an end of that but I, I don't know is the real answer. <laughs> um, other considerations uh, is like bandaging. So the ones that I've seen, they've recovered from surgery in a belly bandage or a stent, and then they're changed to an elastoplast belly bandage. Um, and that's changed every four to five days. Usually it's changed one day post-surgery just to check the incision, but then every four to five days. And once you, when you change it, um, and that time is dependent on the discharge. Like if you see discharge in the bandage, then you change it. And if it slips and it's not covering the wound anymore, then you change it or you can top it up. Um, but yeah, during that, the wound can be assessed. So here you can just see like a nice, normal, healthy wound. wound. So recommendations to owners after discharge. Stabling for 10 to 12 weeks, they can be hand grazed as much as possible. Then after their box rest period, they can have six to eight weeks in a small paddock before returning to work. They should be fed a forage based diet and they should have hay nets throughout the day. So they're an ad lib forage really. Um, and avoid any sudden changes in diet, maintain the worming program and regular dental exams. The wound needs to remain covered for an absolute minimum of 14 days and the bandage should be replaced every four to five days and that the owner should contact you if they have any other concerns. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? I hope that that's what you wanted, whether that's been beneficial to everyone. Thank you, Catherine, for this wonderful presentation. If any of the participants have any question, you can please unmute yourself or drop it into the chat box. If anyone ever wants to speak about colic or anything, 
please feel free to message me or anyone in that coin community. I'm sure we'd all love to speak about it. Uh, yeah, we have one question from Santos Panda. Uh, yeah. Can we say colic simply uh, abdominal pain? Yeah, so I think the, the definition of colic is abdominal pain. So it's not necessarily the list of um, classifications that I showed on the screen, like colic is just abdominal pain, which you can also see with gastric ulcers. Change the bandage daily. Um, no, so what I've seen is that they change the, they'll have a belly bandage on, which they'll then change to an elastoplast bandage. And then they might change that like a day after, um, after surgery, just to check that the wound is still fine. And then the horse might stay in the hospital for another like three days. And they will change the, the elastoplast bandage just before discharge. So that's just like having your final check of the wound before you, um, before the horse is sent home with its owner and then a vet would go out every like four to five days and change it so it definitely doesn't need to be changed daily just initially while it's in the hospital it would be changed probably more frequently yes I hope if that doesn't answer your question please just repeat it <laughs> let me know or if anyone else wants to answer the questions, then feel free because I'm sure that many of you have lo like lots of knowledge on colic that I also don't have. So. I think oh yeah, we have no any further queries, and if any of you have. Any query, then you can contact to Catherine. Uh, Catherine, would you like to say a few words about this program? About the, um, your, your career campfire pro program? Oh, uh, yeah. Or, yeah. I just think that I think that's a fa fantastic opportunity for everyone. Like, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I hope that you get lots of other um, interactive and interesting speakers. Your last one sounded amazing. I don't know anything about C-sections, so that would have been nice to learn about. But yeah, thank you so much for putting it on and giving people the opportunity to learn about different topics. Yeah, and- I think there's another- Can you please share a few words to Javinska? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, would you like to say a few words about this program too? Oh, it, I'm 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 also really happy that that I'm that I had a chance to talk about our community, and I hope that you have also equine lovers to join us, and then we can discuss more cases together um, in our projects as well. But it's amazing because I haven't seen it in another MO to organize uh, such motivating meetings. So I'm really happy, and I'm happy that it's also in English because I'm sure that apart from the veterinary knowledge that we can share, people can also get more confident with their um, with their English, their speaking skills and listening skills, because that's a really, um, it's a really good skill to have in the future to be able to to to, ch to, to travel and and go for different extension placements. So yeah, I think it's, it's definitely an important point of it. It's really nice that you get the initiative in, in yeah, initiative. Uh, thank you, both of you. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Swini Kumarja, IBSA Public Health Extension Officer, for the closing remarks and declare the end of the program. Thank you, Alok. Yeah, I'd like to extend my deepest gratitude to every soul who joined uh, the program and became a part of this webinar and made it a grand one. I'd like to give a bunch of thanks to our resource persons, Ms. Catherine Ross and Ms. Zhu 
Jew um, you despite of their busy schedule, were able to give their valuable time to IBS Pokliava. Career Campfire, being one of the new programs of IBS Pokliava, has already caught the eye of many future veterinarians. I believe it is one of the most uh, important interaction program that any veterinarians must get involved. The team of IVSA Pokliava would also like to thank to IVSA Equine community, IVSA SCOVI and EXO members for their support in today's program. Uh, Career Campfire Season 1, Episode 2, Colic, How to Approach the Case. I believe we all have a uh, similar support and faith from uh, all of us from all of um, from all in upcoming futures also now i ashwini marza section officer of ibs pakliava would like to announce the formal end of the program uh, i believe the today program was truly fruitful thank you